where were you when the pandemic hit? I actually was in hospital with tonsillitis. It was horrible. Um, and then everything that could go wrong went wrong. So I was in there for actually a week and a half and there's like nothing to do but to uh, watch TV. What did you watch? All the stuff on COVID. <laughs> and so oh, I was, <laughs> I was <laughs> like, <"Nabers?" laughs> No. <laughs> I was probably a week before it became really obvious. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it was, I did, when I came back, I, I got to self-quarantine. I'd be put in a hotel. I kind of just made it across that line. And I, it was just such a relief the moment I kind of got back home and I was in a caravan in the back paddock of my parents' farm. And I was just, I, you know, I was just really lucky that I had that space. Well, it's been interesting for us. We had our last festival before COVID called Pitch Music and Arts, and that literally took place the weekend before all the restrictions went in place. So we've had to postpone about 30 events in the last couple of months, so it's been really tough. And obviously, like, we're missing out on the work for like all our staff and employees and all the roadies and people like that that are living gig to gig. So it's been super, super tough on them and just keeping the business afloat during these times has been really difficult. I think it was that fear of not knowing that, you know, how long this is gonna continue, you know, and and how sort of contagious and whatever. I mean, it's, it's the most, it's the scariest thing I guess we've, we've ever been through in our generation. In our generation, anyway, for sure. There's no doubt that the arts haven't really been front and or centre, mm -hmm. right? But in any time when crisis hits, you find that the things that are deemed kind of non-essential mm. become very non-essential. Mm -hmm. And the moment that I remember feeling that it was going to get really bad for, for folks was when I was doing uh, Dancing with the Stars earlier this <laughs> year, and all of them got the same emails on the same day saying that all of their work for the next year was cancelled. Yeah. So... I guess all I'd say that to link to the first point is that I understand that you know the arts can be seen somewhat as superfluous, etc., etc., etc. But that moment still took place for people that thought they had worked for a year. So in any other industry where people had thought they had worked for a year, and it's taken away, that happened to people in this industry. So, oh, oh this, guy, this, <laughs> this has been a hard week. Isn't it funny how? Everybody's kind of going when they when they're going to work in the inner routine. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to kind of go. Oh God, I wish I had a, I wish I had a day off. I wish I had yeah. a time off. And now people now are kind of going. Now we have all the time off. Hey man, I want to go back to work. Yeah. Venues are probably one of the worst hit in my industry. The worst hit people because it's been so hard for them. Like losing all their income, like having really no clarity around it. And then from like what's happening around the world, it just seems that like pubs and clubs are at the very end, you know, like a high density indoor space is just like a no go with this. Cut out what like a live music event is about, you yeah. know, like it is about the music, but at the same time you want that human to human experience, which is getting taken away. All right, during this lockdown, mm. you know, they were giving, they were going to give subsidies to, you know, um, people, you know, give, you know, payment to, to, to everybody, you know, whether or not you had a job, you didn't have a job, whatever, right? Just to keep, you know, people happy. But artists kind of got locked out. Yeah. Now, how much money do the arts bring to Australia? 111 billion per year. If you're considering that, and that's a business. <laughs> oh yeah. That's a business. Mm -hmm. So you mean to mm -hmm. tell me we get locked out because, you know, this is a hobby? You know, somebody had to be on stage. That makes no sense. Yeah, it's also at a time when people need art. Mm. Art moves people and, and, you know, kind of explains our culture. And so it's just something that I find unfathomable to not respect it. You know, if you want to know how important arts are, okay, during this whole, like, lockdown, what did you do most of the time? You were staying inside, you mm -hmm. were watching things. You were, you were, you exactly. know what I mean? And so, and that took artists to make, yeah. right? What, what is it Winston Churchill said? He goes, you know, about, you know, they would think about cutting arts for, uh, cutting funding for the arts because of the war effort. And he goes, well, if we do that, then what are we fighting for? How have you kept busy and kind of artistically fulfilled? Try to be really grateful and just to be present every day. Like I've learned that I can't control the future. So, you know, I can't just keep stressing and then like stress manifests into illness and then it just mm -hmm. harms you. So I'm just trying to be present. Like I've got to like, I, you know, I'm still working. Yeah, it's just, just doing my best.
Uh, like we've just sort of like set up a daily routine. Like we, mm -hmm. we have a 10 a.m. staff all in Zoom call. I'm so sick of Zoom calls though. Like it's driving me nuts. <laughs> I even saw a, a post from like the founder of Zoom being like, I am so sick of Zoom calls. <laughs> well, we're not going in the room for stuff. This is a great time to actually focus on yeah. developing these things we want to develop, get that writing time in. One thing it made me do, and I think a lot of people have done this, is it made you look at the, go, well, all right, I do have more, you know, I had more time on my hands, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, even though I've got a little two-year-old at home, uh, when he's you know either asleep, then I, you get slightly more time. And so you look at things, and it does make you go, wow, the rug can be pulled out from all television, all film, mm -hmm. and if I wasn't doing radio, all live events, they can just dis they can go. So I think a lot of people, like you know, we're doing today, is that you go, all right, what else can I sort of create and do. But I think there's, it is, it's true. But then there's also that other side mm -hmm. of it, that like hustle kind of, yeah. like because we've got this downtime and because we're artists, we should be writing, you know, Shakespeare wrote, blah, blah, blah whatever. Yeah. You know, I, I think that that pressure to hustle also, I think you've got to, um, for me anyway, mm -hmm. I've got to like turn the volume down on that a mm -hmm. bit because we are in a global pandemic. Absolutely. I'm like my partner and we're all going through things, yeah. you know, that it, it's pretty crazy and the uncertainty of what's coming, you know, we've got to kind of um, acknowledge that that's going to shake us and we need yeah. to kind of like make sure that we're giving ourselves space to process Everything all of it on. as well as yeah. creatively have an outlet. And yeah. I think with COVID, there's a lot of people you know, at home making music because they've got so much free time. They're like, oh, I might as well give this music career a shot and even stuff like, we've seen so many more people doing podcasts now because of COVID. And I think it'll be a real boom for creative industries after this passes. I think there'll be a lot more new acts out there trying to make it. So yeah, we could see a real flourish of new acts in Australia and around the world, really. Probably theatre has a tougher road than, again, yeah, compared to TV and film. Audience. Yeah, you need the, once again, you need bums on seats to make the money. Yeah. And you need lot, you know, it, it, it's so hard to make money anyway, that it, it, you only do if you cram that place full of people. But it is, it's one of those things that most people don't realise how many people, are, just to do anything well, the amount of people it takes. Working high intensity, lots of people in a small space to make most productions happen. Finding a way out of this and navigating a new way of working together is, is what a lot of people, I guess, are focusing on right now. Mm -hmm. You know, and reaching out to people who, you know, mm -hmm. may, uh, they haven't heard from in a while, just to make sure, hey, you good? You know, just checking mm -hmm. in, just seeing if you're all right. Just don't want anything, just saying hi. Mm -hmm. You know, and so, and I think that's important too. It's an important time to do that, yeah. absolutely. Because we need that connection. Yeah. Yeah, we need that connection because you don't realize actually how much other people actually affect you. Why do you think creative people are prone to mental health illness and does an artist need to suffer and to create good art? Ego has a lot to do with it. Ego is kind of like a rib cage. It defends the heart. A lot of society is heavily based around ego. You know, what we're wearing. Who, who we're seen with, um, what bill we're getting on, you know, how, how big this is, what other people think of it. And the arts do require a level of participation with other people. So there is an engagement where you, you depend on other people to, for it to resonate with them. When it's rich, when it's good material, or like a really fantastic director, acting really can feel like you're going to like another parallel universe. And if it's like, you know, heavy things, like it affects you. Yeah, there's not enough conversation just to be like, I agree. you can tell a friend like, hey, like I was really affected by this. I, I've, I've pretty much tried to be very aware of my mental health. I'm aware when things get too much. But yeah, I certainly do suffer from anxiety. But so it's always good to just seek help, you know? Yeah. And just have another outlet. Yeah, and well, so, and a professional. Like a professional yes. that tells you, yeah. you know, this is what you can do. And I feel really strong, I feel really proud of myself to be able to go, I'm not okay right now, you know, Absolutely. and I need you. Mental health is, especially in this, in what we do, yeah, it, you, you need to keep a check on it. And, you know, see somebody, see a, see a, a psychologist, you know? 100%. There's no shame in that. N no. None. Do I think a government can do more? Of course. Of course they can do more. And there's nothing worse. And people just need to be heard. And that's the thing. When you feel like you, you're not heard, that's a Oh, yes, that's awful, awful.
Yeah, I think ment- mental health is a massive one, and it's something that I was very aware of at the start of this from just looking at stuff from like China and Italy and saying how like divorces were going up and suicides and stuff like that. And just in like my circle of friends in the last week, a few people have passed away, a couple from suicide and one from an overdose. And it's definitely like ISO has played a big part in those things happening. So it's, yeah, it's a really tricky thing. I know the government, you know, they want to repeal it, but they're kind of doing that balancing act where it's like, this mental health could actually become more of a problem than the virus itself. And I I think for me, I rely on a lot of the kind of just doing the job idea as an actor, is understanding the way everyone else sees what we do will never meet our own. Like, it's always going to be that, you know, uncle or auntie going like, oh, you should get on home and away, or like, oh, it's a tough job, isn't it, when they actually don't understand any of it. Like, that's it's never going to meet or you know when you do do any press the way people a lot of the time want to ask questions about Mm. what you do and the idea and it's something different you go well there's always going to be that awful split where you go oh no one actually gets what what we actually do do. the pressure as well you know like your your absolutely that's the other big one is is, it's this huge pressure Mm. on people only on social media is it glamorous yes and it's a scary thing like I think we've got a long way to go for people to really um, just be okay with it, like being okay with not being okay. To be a true artist, you have to have um, empathy, and I think without having having sort of been through anything tough in your life, you probably aren't really prone to empathy so much. So one of the tricks I've learned is gratitude is just immense. It is. The one emotion that you, when you're just uh, in gratitude, you can't experience sadness, you can't experience anger. That's one of the things I would say to people as like a little hack is spend some time being grateful. You know, we've got the ability to walk, we've got the ability to talk, we've got the ability to listen and perform. And for me, you know, not everyone has that. And we forget that, we take that for granted. We live in one of the most politically stable countries on the planet. We live in one of the wealthiest countries on the planet. And mental health, to me, is a lot like creativity. You need to actually uh, check in with it every day. It should be first and foremost. You should, you know, uh, mental health should be just like your physical health. Like going to the gym. Anything, you know what I mean? And so, yes, look after yourselves, you have to. But I think it's really important in this time just for everyone to go back to that inner child and and like why they love doing this, you know? The play side, the, that, no, yes, I know we don't have to suffer. You've worked in South Africa, Canada, Australia, Mm -hmm. the US, the UK. How do you find Australia kind of compares? Well, it is different for everyone. Because it depends, because on the job, it has different pressures to them not having a job. Our social group will often change depending on what job we're on. And where we live, where we are in the world, will change on every job we're on. Uh, You know, depending on where your career is at and your, a lot of the people that you do connect with, like representation Mm -hmm. and things like that, they've got a different investment in you. That's one thing people really underestimate with festivals is like how expensive a festival is to put on. Like all the festivals we do cost millions of dollars to put on. People think you're just making like 90% profit, but it's not the case. It's like 10% profit. That's totally reversed to what most people think when I talk to them. They're like, oh, you must be making so much money. I'm like, it's really not like that. (laughs) It's just a bit of a seesaw like with events and every time it is a gamble that you've got to be willing to lose everything because people just might not come. It's a passion project and I think being in festivals it's definitely like a lifestyle sort of thing or the music industry in general and I think like the acting industry like it is a lifestyle you've got to be prepared to put everything into it and you're sort of working nearly all the time you know like my phone will go off weekends, night times, all that sort of stuff and you just got to be prepared to give that up to have that lifestyle. You know people don't realise that 41% of Mm. actors live below the poverty line. It's still early days but it still reminds me of You know, Hollywood back in the, um, uh, say like the 30s and 40s, when, you know, it was just getting its feet planted, but starting to get its run. It it still reminds me of that. We need to stop being sort of uh, stuck in the corner Mm -hmm. and kind of put like, all right, this is is our space. It's a weird thing about what we do too, is that even if no one pays for it, it doesn't stop. Yeah. It's that essential. It's that essential. It's that essential both yeah. as, for people to make it, but yeah. as people to, to consume, consume it. Consume it. 
that like it's not it doesn't go away it can all shut down like it's one of those industries that like even if you take everything away from it it endures because it's that important everyone in our industry is so vulnerable anyway mm -hmm. we we it's gig to gig. No, and, the, really? and then most anything on the government generally or anything financial, they usually aren't mm. boxes to tick. Like, mm -hmm. still the system, as old as... Like, it's not like writers and actors suddenly appeared out of nowhere. You know, that if, if you're not an employer with a company that has, like, that's been there for a certain amount of time that gets this much money and fits into that, doing so many of the things that give people stability in your life mm. is, is nearly impossible. Whether that's kind of getting benefits in between, you know, showing totally. income, getting loans, a mortgage. You know, you might be playing a really big room, like the corner hotel, and let's say you're 15 or 16, and you go and see a band at a big room like that, you think, ah, oh, they're huge. But then when you're playing those rooms, and then you find out what the booking agent takes, what the publicist takes, what the record label takes, what the management takes, then the sound engineer, then you got the lighting guy, uh, then you got to pay all the other bands, and you're like, it's not quite what you think. I kind of feel like, especially on young artists, there's this pressure to make it now because yes. Justin Bieber made it or because some other actor made it quite young. And it's like, that's not why you do it. If you're obsessed with the outcome rather than the journey, you're gonna miss out on the journey because it all comes together eventually. You know, if people are acting for 10, 20, 30 years, their careers eventually progress. Eventually something's, you know, grips and it takes off. Same with musicians, if you are around long enough, eventually it, it takes off, it works. That requires a certain amount of self-esteem to be vulnerable enough to just kind of say, okay, everyone else who's an artist and an actor is also feeling what I'm feeling and the rest of the world makes up their mind about it. And if you are worried about what everyone else is going to say or think, you just won't get anything done. And, and like, you're gonna die soon anyway, so what's the matter, who cares? Like, literally think about it. We're not gonna live very long. Like, it's a short life. The people who are the most successful are the hardest workers, not the most talented. You know, they're the ones who work really, really, really hard. So, getting back to people who may be watching this or thinking about COVID or whatever it is, if you're gonna start something now, it's sort of beholden on you to think about, right, what is the version of this that uh, I want to keep producing for a long time because that's where the value in the audience is going to be. Mm -hmm. Thinking about, right, what can I do that's going to take, that's going to be take, that I can do for a long time? And that's where podcasts and YouTube and all that type of thing, you come into it. I think everybody gets in this business for a reason, but mm -hmm. you know, at the end of the day, you really have to love what you do mm -hmm. and you have to consider it a gift that you give out. You know, I think we are such a diverse country, but only 7% of cultural backgrounds of characters were shown on Australian TV dramas compared to an actual 17% that is in the, 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 right the population. Now. I don't know, I think it's, it's gotten better definitely since the study. There's it a has gotten a little better, I, yeah. yeah. I think it's like anything else. You have to kind of let go of the old uh, paradigms mm. and accept, you know. Uh, change. Accept change and yeah. accept the new things. The first place you usually see it will be commercials. You know what I mean? Yeah. You always notice it in commercials because it starts to reflect more of households. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and then it'll it'll uh, then usually theater will pick it up because normally theater is one of those places that will definitely break molds. And then and then obviously and then and then you'll see it in more likely movies first and then possibly TV. For a very long time, like the Asian roles were like either you were a prostitute and you didn't even speak. As a woman of colour, when you take on roles, it's like this extra responsibility of like, am I doing harm to my culture? And I feel like we have to be the ones to write the stories, to, you know, to push for the stories, because if we don't, like no one else Who will. Who else is going to? You know? Yes, yeah, so I think it really has to begin there. Champion, like the industry has to champion, you know, all types of writers mm -hmm. and, and to really honour like those authentic voices, because in the end, like, it creates the most authentic story. I, I think we've still got a long way to go and I think just diversity on all levels is something that we, I think has changed a lot, particularly over the last couple of years. Like I'm really aware, I feel like I've been very lucky to work with a lot of really amazing female directors, producers, mm -hmm. writers, and I know that it's a conscious decision to do that and I guess have a balanced set. I grew up on 
Māori people's country, Tangari country. Mm -hmm. That's where my grandmother's from. That's where all our old people are from. My Irish side were pretty much first settlers to that area. Mm -hmm. You know, I've got white privilege. I'm Aboriginal, you know, I'm a black fella, as mob say, as, you know, I identify as a black fella, but I got white skin. Cousins or friends or people that I was growing up with that had darker skin couldn't escape that. So I could walk downtown and not be seen as, uh, as a black person for the obvious reason. But that, that caused an, uh, another effect, which is I heard what people really thought. So people said what they thought about Aboriginal people. It, it's, it's not like, oh we, oh, we forgot to mention Aboriginal people. Mm. It, it's like deliberately being left out because it's horrific and it's, it makes people uncomfortable mm. and people don't want to talk about it. Aboriginal people being incarcerated mm. and we're saying we need to lift the age of this because we've got 10 year old boys being incarcerated. Like I, I'm, I'm about 85 kilos. I reckon I could take a 10 year old kid. I don't think I need five cops with me. I think I could give him a cuddle and, and make him feel like he's got a future and talk him up and get him going again. I was a youth worker for years and you know, I don't, I don't see why I've got to lock 10 year old kids up and if we want to talk about mm. mental health, mm. Aboriginal people are committing suicide at the highest rate on the planet. And hurt people hurt people. That's what it comes down to. Generations of trauma and trauma. So it's up to the rest of the country at this point to say, I believe we can make a change. So I'm going to choose how I vote and I'm going to vote differently. I'm going to spend my money with Indigenous businesses where I can. It is up to the society to make some big changes to include all of us. And that's radical for some people. For me, I think that's common sense. There's something else I read was 22% of writers wrote a character as Indigenous, 70% mm -hmm. of wrote the character as non-European background, 91% with a disability and 90% um, as LGBTQI. Wow but they were ultimately cast with someone, with someone from else. a yeah. different background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now see, personally, mm. I'll have to say this, that's a bit of a cop-out. Because the thing is, if you wrote it that way, regardless, you can always mm. give somebody a chance. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Whether or not they're young, old, whatever. Just, yeah. you know, take that chance. Give somebody that opportunity to, you know, show what they have. I agree. And so.